So we have uh, insulin receptors that are on both uh, lean and fat tissue throughout the body, and they respond to this um, uh, increased uh, insulin message. And when insulin rises, it goes to the receptors. It says that there's energy available for a nutrients, and, and the tissues will, will absorb that uh, energy. Now, what else happens is if there's excess food, insulin sends message to the fat tissue that there's excess energy, and uh, the, the body fat, it will be stored as body fat. And what's important to realize is our body fat is this unlimited uh, storage space that can keep growing and growing. And this is compared to glycogen storage, which is limited in uh, liver and uh, lean muscle. Uh, so glycogen stores contribute less to insul insulin resistance it plays in, but the reverse happens as insulin goes up, glucagon uh, tends to go down. That's produced by the alpha cells in the pancreas. And and the message there is storage, Every, we're in storage mode. Now insulin will normally suppress appetite and that makes sense as, um, as we eat, um, we're filling ourselves up, insulin rises and, and the message is okay, we're full, we're filling up. So in a normal state, appetite will be suppressed. And so when food is unavailable, the reversal happens. So insulin drops, glucagon rises and, and the message there is okay, there's, there's less food available, we're gonna rely on our, our energy stores uh, for, for energy. Um, and again, it is dietary carbohydrates that, that are the primary trigger, either its presence or its absence. So now we, we start overeating. Uh, what happens? So the excess energy, especially the carbohydrates, are stored as body fat. And uh, we now start to gain weight, and this creates a uh, larger body mass. And this now tells the beta cells, we better produce more insulin because we have more body mass. And so we produce more insulin, and that creates more storage of energy and more body fat deposition. And eventually, with time, the, the, those insulin receptors actually become strained and overstimulated, and they become resistant to this uh, the, the insulin uh, message. Um, the beta cells get strained, um, and they lose their normal response to uh, uh, their normal response, and, and it, the insulin levels get even higher. And we have this paradoxical increase in glucagon. Again, if insulin goes up, glucagon normally goes down. And now glucagon starts to go up, and the alpha cells are strained. And the way to explain this um, this um, uh, resistance or, or the strain is like a um, a sticky or a sluggish gas pedal on, on the car, so you come to a stop sign and uh, or a stoplight and it turns green and you push the gas pedal, nothing happens, so you push it harder and then you know it's sluggish and then the, then the car lunges forward and then you realize that there was too much, uh, I put too, too much gas into it and so I let off the gas and, and so basically it's, it's like pumping the insulin out in, 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 a, in a regular way is what I'm trying to explain. Um, and what develops is this vicious insulin cycle. And, um, and explain, I'll explain in a second how the, the fat cells are actually starving the rest of the body. And as well, it also drives our hunger and appetite. And so this is that vicious cycle. We gain weight. It causes insulin resistance. We increase our insulin production. And we continue to gain weight. And we call it the spiral of death. Another way to explain that is on the left, this is a, a normal individual. The green arrows are normal insulin production. Here's the fat cells. And then in the insulin resistance state, we're now pumping out more insulin everywhere. Most of the insulin is going to the, the fat cells, which have now doubled in size. We have uh, insulin resistance everywhere in the body. And basically, insulin and energy is now being fed to fat tissues. And literally, the fat tissues are starving the body. And so as we gain weight, we actually lose our energy. And it's, and it's often difficult to get overweight people to exercise because they're literally starving themselves. OK, so I said it drives hunger and appetite. Um, and so again, it's this pathologic fluctuation in our in insulin levels that now, as insulin rises, it's actually stimulating appetite. So it's actually doing the opposite of what it's supposed to do. And um, this is all working in the, um, ener the energy or the hunger centers of our brain, the hypothalamus, it becomes resistance itself. And we actually lose central satiety. And 
all we have left are, are peripheral signals of um, feeling full. And that's this swollen, um, stuck, bloated abdomen, and especially carbs no longer suppress appetite, and this concept that we're just a bottomless pit, pit and we can, we can eat. And I always um, mention um, um, the, the holidays where, or Thanksgiving, where we, we overeat and our stomachs are so bloated that, and then we have to go to bed. We call that the food coma. But these overweight patients, their only signal is the bloated abdomen that they're full. And I, I call it the metabolic abdomen, and that's just an unhealthy uh, sense of fullness. Now, there's many other hormones and peptides that can contribute with both hunger, appetite, and insulin resistance. But insulin is, 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 this, is known the best, so we talk about insulin. But um, it is worth mentioning some of the other um, hormones and peptides. And I know this slide is complicated, but basically the point here is that we have um, all these hormones and peptides that really affect hunger centers. And this is really the research of the next 10 years. Um, in fact, we have drugs now, such as GLP-1, um, amylin mimetics, that, are, that have been in the market for the last five or six years that um, basically use them and, and they treat insulin resistance and they suppress appetite. So this, this is exciting for the future. So let's talk about inflammation. And so we have um, this, this concept now where the fat tissue is, is an organ. And unfortunately, that organ is inflammatory and toxic. And we think of it as the gas tank is poisoning us. And it releases toxic substances um, that fuel infl inflammation and insulin resistance. It's toxic everywhere in the body. Um, as we gain weight, uh, we have circulating triglycerides and free fatty acids that are directly toxic to our, our bodies. And we, um, the, the, the um, adipose tissue is releasing uh, hormones or cytokines, of which 95% of them are harmful, unfortunately. And this basically leads to these, these concepts of inflammation, energy storage disease, which I'll talk about, and um, insulin resistance is just one component. And so on the next slide, this is just a different way to look at this condition, where the problem is fat, fat storage. The fat cells are here in the center of the universe, and they're releasing all these toxic substances. Um, actually, adiponectin is, is uh, paradoxically decreasing, and this is the one healthy component that's, that's released, in it, and it drops. And there's a lot to this slide. We could spend hours talking about it. But uh, the point is that uh, it's about uh, fat storage, energy, energy storage, and so the term energy storage disease, which I can't find much in the literature, but I love that term. And so I believe that you know when we talk about inflammation, insulin resistance, energy storage disease, it's one and the same. And this all leads to basically all the diseases in, in that modern society. And if we take it one step further, this slide basically illustrates some more of those associated conditions related to inflammation, energy storage disease. And basically, this is why we're here as healthcare professionals. We're treating all these diseases in modern society. And if I left anything out, just, just name one and we'll put it in the next presentation because it's all connected. And so um, there's this one specific condition, metabolic syndrome, that um, if you have this, you're at an increased risk for uh, heart disease. And I, I just show this here. And so patients have, um, they're obese, they have hyperlipidemia, they have high blood pressure, prediabetes, and it predisposes them to, to heart disease. So let's talk about evaluation. The first thing to understand is that it's a progressive condition from being overweight to eventually being type 2 diabetes. And the best measurement in my office is body measurements, weight, height, BMI, BMI body fat, waist circumference. Um, of course, we want to get a, a, a full family, his, uh, a medical history, a family history. We want to determine it, uh, the other comorbid conditions that we have to treat, and we have to identify patients at risk. And it's very easy to identify patients at risk, since two-thirds of the population have, have this issue. Um, what we like to do is um, the OGT, or the glucose tolerance test, the, the two-hour OGT in our office. The American Diabetes Association and Medicare are recommending uh, using this as a screening tool. Not only do we use it, use it as a screening tool, we use it as a crude tool to actually stage insulin resistance. 
Now, um, the, the, the researchers would scream at me for doing this because they have more elaborate methods, glucose, clamp, homa, and quickie, where we don't have the resources in the clinical practice to do the, that type of blood work and testing. But um, we use the OGT, um, we do three measurements, and, and the degree of um, the number is how we stage the insulin resistance. And uh, I keep a database since this is what I'm interested in. Now I've done over 700 uh, uh, OGTs in my office, and it's all, often fun to look at uh, one patient and compare how the OGT changes with time. Um, we want to uh, measure markers of inflammation, and basically it's a metabolic syndrome evaluation. So hemoglobin A1C screening, um, I've been doing that for 10 years. And in, um, Susan, as I mentioned before, wanted me to specifically say that in 2009, the ADA now has uh, recommended it as a screening tool. And that's great, we've been doing it. Uh, we, get, we get much more information with OGT, but the question is if you have time in your office to do that. Um, we measure C-peptides, lipids, CRP, whatever you want, but the idea is that these, to me, they're markers of inflammation. And it is the degree of insulin resistance that, and the beta cell dif dysfunction that directs our treatment. So, how do we treat it? And this is fun. Um, they taught me how to prescribe medicine, but, and I still do that, but, but when we look at this condition, it is the food, is, is the medicine. It's the lifestyle that we're modifying first. And how do we do this? We remove the primary fuel, which is the carbohydrate. And what does it do? It turns off the insulin switch. Stored energy is re released from the adipose tissue. That promotes lipolysis, or something called healthy ketosis. Um, and we, um, we lose weight, we empty the gas tank, and it becomes uh, anti-inflammatory. This, again, will control hunger and appetite. It increases our sense of fullness. And um, we actually go through carbohydrate withdrawal initially, and we joke with patients that we're signing them up to the uh, Carboholics Anonymous program. And you can literally think of carbohydrates as the drug of choice, and we're trying to rehab them off of that. And so they go through withdrawal. And what we do during that time is encourage patients to, to eat um, uh, uh, healthy, high-fat, high-protein foods, drink a lot of fluids, and they feel terrible, and we tell them that's a positive response because you've made changes to your diet. And I know that as the body begins to burn body fat, instead of relying on dietary carbohydrates, that withdrawal will go away. So we need to support them during that period of time. Um, again, we are going to be eating less carbohydrates, and so we're going to regulate those in insulin levels, and we're going to control our appetite, and um, the patients will lose weight. So this is an important slide. Um, so again, diet, we want to talk about the other macronutrients. So the dietary fats and proteins. Again, they're not the inflammatory fuels because they don't stimulate the insulin like <coughs> carbohydrates do. And by default, you're going to increase the fat and protein in your diet. And then the important part is about the fats. Fats are not so bad. And this is, this is one of the sticking points for 60 years. So we all agree now that there are these monounsaturated fats uh, essential fatty acids that, that are healthy. Um, the reason that fats are good is that it pr promotes satiety. And the big point, or the major point here is that again, fat is not the primary fuel for this condition. So why have we spent 60 years focusing on fat consumption? Okay? Um, so um, we all agree that there's some problems with trans fats. And, and this is another punchline here is that it is actually the combination of fats, cholesterol, and carbs in the diet that, that, that is, that's a killer. And the way I explain that to my patients is that if my patient says, you know, I'd like to have a cheese omelet in the morning, I say, that's fine, go have a cheese omelet. The problem is what we typically eat the cheese omelet with, and it's all the carbohydrates. So um, toast, hash brown potatoes, pancakes, maple syrup, orange juice. So as soon as we combine those foods, we now raise what's called the glycemic index of the meal, and I'll explain that. We turn on the ins insulin switch, which is the message now to store that food, and we drop dead from a heart attack. So another way to say it is the combination of the, uh, the carbs, fat, um, and, and cholesterol in the diet that, that is a killer. And so we don't want to do that. 
And um, of course, we need healthy, healthy protein so that you don't use, use your muscle mass as you're 